many patients ask about clinical trials and what what uh, what that is. And the the simplest answer is that there are various phases of doing experiments on humans. That's what clinical trials are. Most of them are therapeutic, which means that there's a treatment involved. Some clinical trials don't involve therapies, but but they're most interested in clinical trials that involve therapies. And therapies can be very, very novel and very, very new with very little information, including an uncertainty even about the side effects or the appropriate dose of a drug or a treatment strategy, and those are called phase one. And they typically involve a treatment or a drug or a combination of drugs that have never been tested before in that patient population. And it's a slow-growing process where pa numbers of patients are treated with various doses. Everything stops. We look at side effects. If they're appropriate, then we might increase the dose or the frequency and keep going along that process until we reach what's called a maximum tolerated dose which is the dose that's the least toxic, but we hope might be the most effective. That's called phase one. Phase two is at that moment, we decide that a dose is safe and it can be given in a certain way. Then we start to say, is this really effective or not? And that's the first signal. That phase two trial is the first signal that there may be something that's working. So maybe 50, 60, or 70 patients would be treated with a, a drug um, and at the end of that assignment of all of those patients treated and analyzed, a certain percentage will may, may have a benefit, and we'd decide whether that benefit's realistic or not, uh, good enough to go into what's called a phase three study. And a phase three study simply is comparing that treatment with what's called the standard of care. So patients are typically randomized with a flip of a coin to get treated with what's known to be the best treatment with the new treatment, comparing those two directly and deciding whether the new treatment is as good as, worse than, or better than the standard of care. If it's better, that becomes the new standard of care. Patients can find out about clinical trials through their primary care physician, who may not have direct information but would know to find access to physicians, or they could search out clinical trials on their own. And the advantages now is that the internet has many, many uh, websites specifically for brain tumor patients that lists clinical trials, where they're being done, who the contact person is, um, and that's a very good way to find out. Uh, most patients are treated by a, a medical oncologist or a chemotherapist who are all very well versed in the idea of clinical trials and they usually know within a region who the best centers of excellence would be for brain tumors and can direct them or even call that physician directly and access to clinical trials should be, um, I, I hope, uh, available to anybody with a brain tumor. So I think from a historical perspective, it's been very interesting. I've been a, a cancer doctor for many, many years, and the number um, and diversity and excitement in the clinical trials arena right now in brain tumors is at its peak. It's amazing. And what I can see going forward, even in the next year or two, is an explosion of really interesting exciting, um, very compelling new ideas and strategies that are coming out of the basic science research and translational science research that's ongoing in the country right now. So I, I envision that not only is it great now, certainly better than it ever has been, but going forward we're going to see uh, really, really brand new novel strategies tested in a much uh, more efficient uh, manner. In terms of access to clinical trials, the, there is, uh, I think, still a dilemma and a problem in this country in that financial support through the public sector, through the private sector, is still inefficient. It's been a very complex environment for patients to navigate through. There's inconsistencies in what's covered and what's not covered by insurance carriers and the government. Um, and I see this as an emerging bigger problem going forward as various priorities change in the country. And I know that that's a political statement, but it's a reality that our patients are facing right now. And it affects access to what I think are very important novel new clinical studies. But hopefully there'll be a, a, a change in the environment in this country that will support the idea that any patient with cancer should have access freely to clinical trials. Patients and families oftentimes ask me how they can help uh, so that access to clinical trials is not such a logistical nightmare. Um, and I suggest that they first 
uh, focus on their own treatment and make sure that they understand what's going on uh, and take care of themselves. But I think at the same time, they can ask friends, family, um, advocates, uh, groups that are uh, uh, trying to help, uh, members of Congress, uh, state legislatures, all to be a participant in this process of ensuring that access to clinical trials is universal and is not difficult uh, and does not distract from the ongoing struggle that patients are already having along with their families to get access to, to, to treatment.